that it's going to create the behavior trees or path planning, and this uh, that will be the pushed back in uh, to the edge devices and make action. Uh, this our architecture is something like this, and again, this is really common. Like uh, what do we do actually? Next slide, please. And that is not uh, a wishful thing or just the idea. Uh, but we can actually make the product based on that architecture in the market, which is doggy dog robot uh, named Ivo. It's in the market. It, it is based on ROS1, uh, not ROS2, yet, and it is available in Japan, the US market, since 2018. And if you find any interest, uh, please do consider to purchase. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. So the IBO platform is uh, like this. It is based on the application processor uh, from Qualcomm Snapdragon 820. The product name is APQ1896. And uh, the bunch of sensors, that, as you can see on the left, uh, connected to the application processor with, uh, say, two cameras, front face and back, uh, single TOF, uh, touch sensors, and so on. This, and the two support quick action uh, to the user, to the, I mean, like for user experience. There is a microprocessor connected with uh, AP and actuators uh, to control by that. Uh, this is just, uh, actually we have actually 20 actuators, and this is just the introduction about the hardware. Let me proceed to ROS specific aspect. Next, next please. Okay, so before we moving on, uh, ROS specific feature which is done by us, let me explain about how ROS1 transport works. Uh, once the application starts, the publication or subscription, it will use TCP as default. You can, you can actually switch it into UDP if you want to, but as default, you're going to use TCP. And the framework knows that source and destination information like port number or IP addresses, uh, they are, these information will be registered in the master node. And as you can see here, uh, focus on blue uh, directions. Even if uh, the, your connection is local host in the same host, it will use TCP anyway. So, but actually, in some cases, like Ivo, it's kind of like a single system. The most of the data is shared uh, between nodes in the same host. In that case, the question is, why do we have to use TCP? Uh, IP, every single time you publish the data or receiving the data, you're going to have to deal with the TCP and IP stack. Uh, it does not make any sense. And next slide, please. So that we create a new network class, which is UDS ROS, uh, you can see in the middle, and it stands for uh, Unix Domain Socket, uh, of course. And it, it is really natural to use Unix Domain Socket for, you know, your, if your connection is localhost in Linux system, um, so we just take advantage of that. And as you can see that the difference here is new component UDS ROS is introduced so that if the communication is uh, system inside, it will use Unix domain socket only. And when it has to go beyond the network, it will use TCP uh, automatically. This new layer is perfectly concealed by API, uh, by ROS, so that the user application doesn't need to know anything about it. Just, uh, all you have to do, do is just uh, pull our source code and rebuild the ROS communication packages and done. Uh, and it's going to be faster. Next slide, please. Okay, our source code is already open sourced. So I think it could be worth to give it a shot. And if you find any problems, let us know. Next slide, please. And so we just go with ROS. Uh, the reason here is it is open source and the main line. And uh, sticking with the main line is actually, I think, key if you work on the open source project. And ROS is exactly the X system uh, for Robotix application. Uh, like for me, it is like a Linux uh, or Robotix X system why I'm not using. So, uh, so what's more is that development tools uh, such, as, such as simulations, virtualization, uh, you know, like debug utilities for Robotix. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, and with that back end, we put like everything together from our experience, and that is the IBO. So the Robotix software, hardware, cloud, and the IoT experiences, and wireless cameras, 
the securities from a mobile platform. We put everything together, and the result comes out as liable in the market now. Next, please. Okay, on this page, let me let me explain quickly activity for the ROS2 that we have been working on. We most likely uh, now working on ROS2, uh, not ROS1, aiming at support uh, the product in Sony. So we have been working with ePosma, which uh, the, the company based in Spain, to integrate the shared memory zero copy framework for FastDDS. So this is not only having shared memory, but also keep you know also keep the DDS functions at the same time. That is said, uh, you can have shared mem shared memory zero copy framework with DDS network communication, and this feature is agnostic from the user application. So all you have to do is to use ePosma's FastDDS. And also, we have been working on the content of the topic. Uh, this can allow us to do the filtering task very much efficiently on the right side. And now the design is open, and we are about to start implementation. And since our focus is uh, uh, middleware layer, so that's the, what we have been working on. And we will keep working on issues, uh, features to support the product in Sony. Next page, please. Okay, the huge difference for ROS2 is that we can actually support the distributed system. Actually, you can do that using ROS1, but ROS1, you have to deal with the ROS master, which is server client architecture. So server goes down, everything goes down. So this cannot actually be supported uh, since there is a master. But with ROS2, you can do that. Uh, there will be some uh, definitions about distributed system. I put two things here. Uh, we would say uh, fail independently, and it appears to be a single system for the user experience. Next page, please. And why distribute the system is so important for us? Well, let me explain that background reasons. And the first one, it, first one is a collaborative robotic system. The more complicated uh, and a difficult task is, the more collaborative, collaborative robot system gets. So. It is easy to imagine that you, you know, like a use cases such as factory or logistics, uh, robots working together to single task. And uh, second one is uh, how we can control the fleet. Uh, maybe it, it, maybe it's easy uh, if you just control a few robots. Maybe you want to three robots. That, that is fine. But what if it comes to ten, hundred, thousands robots uh, in your factory or something? There should be some fleet management control system ready uh, to manage your entire system. And the third one is for the development. Uh, it should not be complicated even with that issue, even if it comes to the distributed system. As application engineers aspect, uh, they do not really care about the operations. Uh, so they just do not like it. So it is more likely, it is more like, uh, hey, Application engineer could say, hey, I want to use my application or my robot to see if it works or not without any extra cost. So this is really important to support the product because it has to be easy, quick, and efficient as the system aspect. And the fourth one is, uh, what is the application? Uh, what, what if the, uh, the application goes crash at night in the factory? Uh, I think nobody wants to get paged in the night uh, and it would be nice if the application comes back online automatically, and then we can debug later or something. So we, we, we can keep the service available. And finally, once it comes to the HIoT devices, there has to be some abstraction layer in the framework. This is because the edge devices are way more complicated and the more kinds, uh, maybe compared to the cloud computation, maybe depending on specific hardware devices. Next page, please. So after all, uh, what we are trying, what we are trying to do is something like this. On the left, you can see the current situation that we have. The application needs to be integrated into the system every single time, uh, if, even if the application is almost same. And because part, this is because the platform and the system is different from one to another, but it takes time uh, for application and system developers. The huge pain here is that. This cost is really operation, not the development for the software. And we do not like that. Uh, we don't want to do that anymore. So no, I think nobody does. 
So then you can see that on the right, that is new architecture, simply in one word. What? Uh, it's like uh, once you develop the application, it can be run and deployed to anywhere. And de deployment is not really a task for the application engineers, so they can just push, they can just focus on the application. Uh, that is exactly what we want to achieve with this new architecture. Next page, please. And we have been considering Kubernetes uh, against this situation and the problems. And the, the answer uh, we, we have now is we could do that with Kubernetes. I am not going to mention about details about Kubernetes since this is Ross uh, conference, and, but it can support the following features, uh, deployment, maintenance, uh, roll up and down uh, the application without any downtime, you can keep the application running, and administration and the device capability management. Uh, and the scalability up to 10, more than 10,000 nodes at the same time in the single cluster. Okay, next page, please. And using ROS2 and Kubernetes, uh, you can actually do this as a distributed system. Of course, the talker, a listener in this figure, is just examples, but ROS2 or the DDS runtime can work with uh, the Kubernetes, uh, with the uh, container, uh, network interfaces that we, as you can see, the layer two emulation, uh, it works fine uh, with multicast. So, and there will be the dashboard you can see that on the left uh, to control your deployment and life cycle uh, using web UI. And all we have to do is to describe the deployment YAML file, uh, where do you want to dis deploy your application, what the dependency for the hardware or any labels you, you want to prefer or something. So with the Kubernetes, application engineer just cares about the container. Uh, I like that idea. Then push. Uh, that's, that's it. That's all it is. And the rest will be taken care of by Kubernetes uh, or administrator to start deployment wherever you want. Next slide, please. So what about the device uh, abstraction? Uh, there is the interface that Kubernetes supports as in uh, device plugin, you can see that. And it is usually to add your own device, such as ZPU, to the Kubernetes world or something, something like that. The plugin needs to be implemented by a vendor to advertise that device to the Kubernetes. And, and then the Kubernetes can control that resources. And you can see just, you can just say that this application that requires device A, and the Kubernetes knows automatically and allocates that device A and deploy that application to the specific node which has device A. So you can actually do that. And for example, uh, maybe let's say like a speech recognition application that require, requires four physical mics, or maybe you develop a roster application container uh, with IMU uh, or to access the ZPU or something like that. But you can do that using device abstraction uh, for Kubernetes. Next page, please. So finally, uh, from our experience so far with ROS2 and Kubernetes, uh, we can actually support something like this. Uh, cloud and edge world can be federated. It, seem, it seems and it appears to be a single platform. And you can deploy your application once it's ready or service anywhere based on the capabilities. And the application does not have to be lost to, in this case, but anything else, if runtime is supported in the container. And with the device product I mentioned before, we can control the device dynamically, then control the deployment uh, with dependencies. This allows us to have really flexible platform and architecture, uh, adjusted edge IoT devices, and also cloud. And that scales up to more than more than thousands nodes. That's that's what we have been working on. Okay, I think uh, that's it. Thank you, Tomoya San. Yeah. Now we'll move on to a short Q and A session. Participants do reminded that you can submit your questions by sending the QR code at the right side of your screen.
Participants, please remind that you can submit your questions uh, if you have by scanning the QR code on the screen now. Okay, Tomoyasa, we have one question uh, from participants. The question is, why one ROS have two systems, system A and system B? System and system B, uh, I, I don't know, which picture? The last one? Uh, <laughs> if, I, I, I mean, like, uh, if you work on the distributed system, system A and system B is connected together to work together, for a specific task, and uh, I don't get the question exactly. Does it answer the question? Hello? Um, Tomoya-san, I think the participant yeah. is asking about this, like, Uh, no, actually, I don't really understand the question. Uh, this, <laughs> what about this do? What, what does it mean, uh, system A and B? And ROS has two systems. Uh, if you want, you can have uh, multiple systems using ROS to create the distributed system. So I think it depends on the use cases and the application. Uh, and in, yeah, and in our case, we care about we care about the distributed system. So there would be a lot of systems using ROS too, I think. 